Okay, um, I think we'll we'll begin. I'm Roger McGinty. I'm a professor at Durham University in the northeast of England. Um, you're very welcome to this ISA webinar, which is on occupations, interventions, and territorial disputes. And I think everyone would realize that it's an extraordinarily topical issue, a very timely webinar, and we're grateful to ISA for hosting us. And we're here today to uh, discuss and, and hear about two um, fantastic books. I've had the opportunity to um, delve into both. Um, we're going to begin uh, with a colleague, uh, a nearby colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Geist Pinfold, who is a lecturer at the School of Government and International Affairs and at the Durham Global Security Institute here at Durham University. And um, Rob is going to talk to us and introduce his book, which is Understanding Territorial Withdrawal, Israeli Occupations and Exits. Rob is going to speak for uh, 15, 20 minutes tops. And then um, I'm delighted that we're going to uh, have a double-handed um, exposition of a book by Amelia Justina Powell. Uh, she is Professor of Political Science and Law at the University of Notre Dame, Go Irish. Uh, and she is joined by her fellow um, uh, author, uh, uh, Krista E. Wigand, who is Professor of Political Science at the University of Tennessee and Director of Global Security uh, at the Howard Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy. And their book is The Peaceful Resolution of Territorial and Maritime Disputes. And I have to say the, the title has resonated with me this week of, as I've been reading about this uh, barrier, this um, bar barrier that has been built uh, by um, uh, by China uh, of the the in in disputed uh, territory between China and and the Philippines, so both books really fit into the uh, area of strategic studies. Both problematize the issue of winning and losing, and try to transcend or at least analyze how we can transcend the, the, the this binary. And both delve into real world and pressing problems that, uh, whilst they may look at particular case studies, we can think of multiple other case studies they apply to. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about both books. So let's begin with you, Rob, if we can, and you have 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you, Roger, and thank you to the ISA for organising this. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so uh, you can look at my um, slides, which is probably marginally better than looking at me talk for 15 to 20 minutes. There we are. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, so uh, I won't spend too long introducing myself because Roger very kindly did that. Uh, but my name is Rob Guys Pinfold and I'm presenting my book, uh, Understanding Territorial Withdrawal, Israeli Occupations and Exits. This was released um, in June of this year by Oxford University Press. It actually began life in 2014 as a uh, PhD thesis. Uh, and then eventually I got that PhD in 2018 and it's now finally come out in 2023. Um, so call it what you like, either a, a long term labor of love or a trial of blood, sweat, tears and perseverance. Um, the end result is the same. Uh, what I actually do in this book is I look at, as it suggests, occupations and exits, particularly focusing on Israel. Now, the origins of this study, I guess, are from my um sometimes conflicting and always dual identities. Uh, I am, as you can tell from my accent, um, British born, uh, but I'm also an Israeli citizen and I've lived in Israel for um, around eight years in the past. Uh, and these are two countries that I think it's fair to say have been involved in um, many contentious occupations and correspondingly many exits from those occupations, which are often controversial, be that uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, southern Lebanon or uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, for example. But what I noticed in uh, these two countries was there was kind of a, a commonality here in that very, very rarely does the occupier 
have sole agency in deciding how and when to conclude its occupation. Very often you see occupiers go into a territory uh, with a set of objectives and leave without achieving those objectives, or indeed saying they're going to stay for a, a specific period of time. It's normally de a, a declared short period of time and then actually lasting much longer uh, in that occupation uh, or intervention. So I wanted to look at what variables and inputs and factors account for that variety in the duration of occupation. Uh, to cut a long story short, what makes some states perpetuate occupations, but then on the other hand, what makes states withdraw uh, from those occupations? But before I get into the nitty gritty uh, of the data, I wanna start off um, with um, the problems themselves. Why should we be interested in occupation and withdrawal? And what do we mean by occupation and withdrawal or occupation and exit? Well, first of all, um, occupation, I think it's fair to say is a pretty negative value laden term today, uh, but it does have uh, some sort of, um, I guess, shared understanding in international law. Ideally, it's, you know, in, in legal terms, it's when a state controls a foreign territory over which it does not claim permanent sovereignty. So uh, you have a state controlling a territory. Uh, they are the ones that are in charge of that territory, but they have not annexed it. They have not applied their sovereignty to that territory and said, this territory is ours uh, and we're never going to leave. So there's this kind of implicit assumption in occupation that it is temporary, that it will at some point be uh, concluded. And there are two routes for that to happen, for an occupation to end. The first of those is that the occupier annexes the territory. Now, this has often been the outcome of occupations uh, in the past, but um, with, I guess, um, the crystallization of um, changes in, in international laws and norms which discourage annexation, um, uh, there's been an upsurge if occupation is continuing, uh, though occupations continue in global politics of occupiers withdrawing from the territory rather than annexing that territory because contemporary law and norms which have spread uh, through most of the world now sees annexation as illegitimate even if it does still happen and i wanted to fit, uh, focus on occupation particularly because even if annexation is supposedly forbidden and discouraged occupation even if it's a negative value laden term is something that's um, not discouraged you know even uh, uh, organizations that try and prevent or disincentivize war like the United Nations understand that occupations and interventions are going to happen in global politics. And indeed, they remain uh, prevalent today. Yes, these occupations are supposed to be short, according to international norms and law, but very often they're not, basically. So I wanted to look at, uh, again, at what causes that uh, temporal variance in occupations. And the relevant literature is actually very rare, even though, as Roger said, this is a very pressing and, uh, I guess, topical uh, subject, there is actually very little uh, literature on occupation, and even less on exit from occupation. And what literature does exist often tends to conflate between occupation and other forms of territorial control. For example, uh, you can read books on the British occupation of Ireland, for example, even though actually Ireland was annexed by the British state. It was uh, from the early 19th century, so it wasn't technically an occupation. I've even read books, you know, about uh, applying understandings of occupation, contemporary understandings of it to very, very, shall we say, historic case studies like the Roman quote unquote occupation of Gaul. Uh, so there is a definite um, indulgence in com uh, concept stretching, which is quite surprising, really, because even if there's not much literature on this topic, the literature does agree that states, when they're occupying, behave differently to states when they're, say, annexing a territory because um, there's there's different stakes involved, there's different decision-making inputs. So there's a clear gap in the literature for a study that focuses on contemporary understandings of occupation. Now, what about uh, exit? Why, why is exit uh, an interesting part of this discussion? Well, um, I think it's because... I always think there's some sort of enduring um, issues with exit that tend to manifest indeed over the centuries. And the first, the first of these is um, illustrated by this quote. You have brought an army into the country, but how do you propose to take it out? And this was actually said by a Afghan um, chieftain during the first British invasion of Afghanistan way back in 1839 to an invading British official. And it really captures the, uh, I guess, something that is, quite a common theme with occupations that very often yes we know the decision to go into a territory is contentious it's often a difficult decision but very rarely do occupiers have a uh, a well-defined or operationalized plan for exit 
more often than not, they tend to get stuck in what my book calls the occupation trap, continuing and perpetuating an occupation, even if they think that actually the status quo isn't particularly good for us and it's not uh, fulfilling uh, what it's supposed to be doing. And that is exemplified by the second quote. This is actually from George Orwell's book, Burn the Nights. And he recounts a conversation between a British officer and himself in Burma, where the British officer actually admitted, we've no right in this blasted country at all. Only now that we're here, for God's sake, let's stay here. And that really, to me, exemplifies this, what I call the occupation trap. And there is, of course, this persistent hubris uh, with occupation. There's this cartoon here on the right, illustrates with the US occupation of Haiti. This idea that an occupier can just go in and impose their governance and basically right all the local wrongs and then leave whenever they want. And it's obviously... Um, uh, you know, captures the the racialized imagery of the time of, you know, the, these very small Haitians being told what to do by this gigantic U.S. Marine who's kind of just, you know, preaching the gospel to them. And the caption of the cartoon in small text is the missionary. And this is not something that's gone away. You know, this is a, referring to the occupation of Haiti in 1915 to 1934. But we all remember, well, those of us who are old enough to remember will recall George W. Bush's mission accomplished speech on the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln back in 2003, when the mission was very much accomplished and things took very much a turn for the worst from there. In terms of my research questions, then, overall, I'm looking at why do some occupations end whilst others persist? And what factors influence an occupier to withdraw from an occupied territory or entrench themselves within that territory? And I look at what I call three arenas of bargaining. These are basically levels of analysis. Often the territorial conflict literature um, tends to focus on one level of analysis. And I was actually interested in how these different levels of analysis interact to generate a policy. And that policy can either be perpetuating an occupation or indeed exit. Uh, and those three arenas of bargaining are domestic. So what goes on within an occupier's domestic sphere in terms of values, balance of power, etc., to uh, political dynamics, international. So bargaining between the occupier and the third parties, not privy, not directly involved in the conflict. And then, of course, bilateral bargaining, violent or nonviolent between occupier and occupied. And here are my case studies. As you can see, there's quite a few, uh, mainly concentrated on Israel, five of the seven case studies here are Israel. And this often, I guess, got me in a bit of trouble when I was presenting my PhD at, uh, uh, at methodology workshops. People would say to me, you can't generalize from looking at just one country. And I would retort and say, look, um, this isn't just one case study. Yes, this is one milieu, but actually this is a multiple embedded case study. There are uh, many, many cases of Israeli occupations and exits. It's not just one. And there's also interesting variations. Some of these ended in withdrawals, Israel's withdrawal, occupation and withdrawal, for example, from the Sinai Peninsula, southern Lebanon and the Gaza Strip, but also occupations without withdrawals. Israel's occupation of the West Bank, for example, and of course, the Golan Heights. There's a variation on um, what I call the belligerent. So Israel's bilateral bargaining partners, sometimes those are state level actors, sometimes those are non-state actors, and sometimes they're both. Uh, but to test for... Um, uh, the the generalizations that I garner from looking at Israel, I also had another multiple embedded case study, and that is the U.S.'s occupation and exit from the island of Hispaniola in the early 20th century, which comprises of two states, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. So it's two different multiple embedded case milieu, one uh, small state or non-great power and one great power. Uh, plenty of uh, ability there to generalize from having so many case studies, I would argue. So what are my key generalizable findings? Well, in every case of territorial withdrawal in both of those, Amelia, there were six commonalities. First of all, uh, withdrawal was always a gradual and complex process of policy reassessment involving all three of those arenas of bargaining. Now, this is important because um, a lot are, there, there, there tends to be a lot of, um, I guess, conjecture within Israel, for example, that some of these withdrawals were kind of spontaneous, irrational, spur of the moments they with leaders beliefs or Id simple, you know, idiosyncratic ways of doing business that one morning Ariel Sharon, Israel's prime minister, wakes up and decides to upend all of his own uh, history of being a right winger in Israel's entrenched territorial policies and leave Gaza. And I say, actually, no, 
There's no evidence for that. In each case, it's a gradual accumulation of costs across each of those three arenas of bargaining that eventually cause Israel's leaders to, uh, or the US's leaders indeed to snap and say, look, this is no longer working. You know, uh, sunk costs ain't going to do the job anymore. We need to leave because the benefits are so low and the costs are so high. Uh, one of the um, factors that precipitates that realisation is enemy violence. So in each of these case studies, there was a dramatic upsurge in enemy violence before each withdrawal. Now, this wasn't necessarily immediately before each withdrawal, but there was always this upsurge in enemy violence that causes elites and public opinion within the occupier to rethink the status quo strategic utility. If an occupation is supposed to bring you security, this change perception that actually an occupation is creating violence and instability makes you rethink uh, and consider where actually perpetuating an occupation is a good idea. Third of all, um, it's not just about occupier and occupied. There's this really critical role uh, for third parties. Now, this was more important in the case of Israel, which you would expect because Israel's a non-great power, right? It's more susceptible to pressures uh, and coercive diplomacy from more powerful states in the international system. But it was also the case with the US, despite the US being a regional hegemon in its uh, uh, and controlling uh, uh, and having basically very little uh, to fear from from rivals, uh, including other great powers, it was still susceptible to public opinion, which caused it to reconsider the global public opinion, which caused it to reconsider the utility of those occupations of Hispaniola. Um, fourth of all, now this is more relevant to Israel. No withdrawal was ever truly unilateral. Uh, and that's important because two of the Israeli withdrawals I study, Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip and southern Lebanon, are often labelled unilateral in that Israel didn't reach a deal with um, its belligerents in the bilateral arena, Lebanese state, Hezbollah, or the Palestinians in the case of Gaza. Uh, so it's seen that, you know, Israel sort of just um, basically said, right, you know, we've had enough, we're leaving, we're not talking to anyone, we're just leaving. And actually, that wasn't the case. Yes, Israel didn't negotiate with those local actors, but Israel basically changed its bargaining partners, swapping a bilateral bargaining partner for one in the international arena. So Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon was coordinated with the UN to the extent that Israel and the UN actually um, made changes to the recognized Israel-Lebanese border without the direct involvement of the Lebanese state, for example. Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip was conducted with the Americans, again, with the extent that this determined the contours of the withdrawal and what concessions Israel would receive from the Bush administration. So we often think of withdrawal in the Israeli context as land for peace. Israel, you know, a bargain for exchange. Israel gives up territory in exchange for political concessions from its Arab adversaries. So actually, this was pretty similar. Israel just... Um, gave up land in exchange for political concessions from different adversaries, oh, sorry, different um, external uh, partners or states or international organizations. Uh, fifth of all, a domestic consensus preceded each withdrawal. So there was no case, you know, some of these withdrawals are, again, there's this perception in Israel that there's kind of like a stab in the back myth that these withdrawals were effective, they were working. Some of these occupations were effective, the occupation of Gaza, the occupation of Lebanon. These were doing the job, but actually it was an irrational, casualty-averse uh, elite or, you know, loathe to use the phrase, but a deep state that kind of conspired to get Israel out of these territories. And in no case was that true. Occupation may have begun as a consensus policy, but, it also, but withdrawal then actually took place with a domestic consensus behind it. And I guess most interesting for me, every time an occupier withdrew, it entrenched itself elsewhere. So I guess this is challenging if, if you're on the sort of conflict resolution side of things, because you think withdrawal is a good thing. You know, withdrawal is a way to resolve a conflict. But actually, in many cases, uh, in every case here, in fact, uh, the US and Israel, every time they withdrew from a territory, they kind of used the lessening of pressure across those three arenas of bargaining as a um, as a strategic opportunity to entrench themselves in disputed or occupied territory elsewhere. Now, this kind of goes against a lot of the literature on territorial conflict that suggests, for example, that states might um, uh, exert resolve over a territory they don't really care about in order to not undermine the deterrence elsewhere on a territory they do care about. So it's kind of the opposite of that dynamic, leaving one territory to entrench yourself in a more important equally disputed territory. And these commonalities were absent in Israel's cases of occupation without exit. And that is, of course, the Golan Heights and the West Bank. So uh, to conclude, then, uh, I guess I should always end with this because this often gets me a lot of flack, this, you know, the enemy bargaining comment, because people have said to me, so 
you're saying that, you know, the only language Israel understands is force. You know, people need to use violence against Israel. But I think this is a reductionist and dangerous claim because there's often this is actually what the Palestinians uh, learned in the past, that, you know, using force uh, will get Israel to uh, uh, give up what you can uh, without actually entering into negotiations. And that's not entirely the case. That violence was necessary, but not sufficient. You needed international pressure. You needed uh, a new pro-withdrawal domestic consensus. And you often don't get that just through shocking levels of violence. In fact, as a second Defada showed, that made Israel's um, domestic arena more resilient and less keen on a withdrawal from the West Bank, as just one example. And finally, because I don't want to go on for too long, my study shows that occupation, and I guess this, you could argue, has been vindicated by uh, uh, recent events and occupations and exits. Occupation is a relatively ineffective policy choice. Occupiers often come with this hubris that they can go in and go out and basically no one else gets to choose. But as we often say in strategic studies, the enemy has a vote, right? Um, and often occupations can lead to path dependency and entrenchment, this sunk cost fallacy. If we spent so long in here and expended so much blood and treasure, um, if only you know a few more years, one last push and then everything will be all right. And that's very rarely uh, the case. And it, in fact, you often lead to this perpetuation of occupation uh, or a contentious withdrawal. And I will end there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rob, and, and thank you for uh, being uh, respectful of, of time constraints. Uh, before I pass over to Amelia and Krista, can, can I just say that questions are very welcome in the chat, and then we'll hope to get to uh, to, to those uh, at the end. But let's move on swiftly. Thank you very much, Rob, and let's move on to Krista and Amelia, please. Okay, so um, the way that Krista and I will org organize that, that talk, I'm going to start with the more theoretical section, and then um, my co-author Krista Wiegand will talk about a specific case, which is South China Sea dispute arbitration, and follow through with some empirical findings. Um, this book is, a, um, I think, a fruit of a long year, many years cooperation between uh, Krista and myself, we have worked for a long time on territorial disputes in particular. And finally, we we're very pleased that this fruit of our labor has been published also in the University of Oxford. So first, I'm going to start with, with the puzzle of the book. Um, it's really simple. And I think following um, our previous wonderful presentation also as important. Why do states seek different peaceful resolution methods in territorial and maritime disputes? Um, obviously, while many of those disputes end up on conflictual routes and involved multiple attempts at military intervention or military activities, Really, majority, uh, the majority of time during a lifespan of a territorial and maritime dispute, uh, states actually choose to attempt resolution via peaceful means. Um, as I always tell my students, we just unfortunately don't hear about, about those. However, they are extremely important as the ongoing territorial and maritime disputes that are experiencing militarizations demonstrate. The book is unique because it brings together a variety of literatures. I would say that the book sits on um, the cusp between international relations, so the scientific study um, special to political science, but also international law and comparative law. Um, we have a lot of uh, mixed methods in the book because we have large and quantitative cross-sectional time series analyses, but also we spoke to people that are actually involved in um, those disputes. So there's a lot of emphasis on human factor, human involvement in those disputes. We spoke with multiple judges that are um, on the resolution part of those disputes, 
to international arbitrators. We spoke to a host of legal counsel involved um, on behalf of states in those disputes. We spoke to policymakers, generals, um, and multiplicity of those people, I think, provided us with a really interesting insight into the dynamics and strategic selection. So um, starting first with overview of the methods, there is multiplicity of methods that international law offers states that do decide to settle their dispute in a peaceful way. First of all, they can negotiate. This is a really simple way um, to solve uh, a dispute. Here we have an image from the Meuse River negotiations between Belgium and Netherlands. Those two states successfully negotiated their border um, along the river. Um, it was a very, uh, I would say, uh, beneficial experience to both states, and now the dispute is settled. Sometimes, however, negotiations don't work. For one reason or another, um, states are not feeling comfortable with settling via negotiations or just, uh, just not, not credible. So states may move to non-binding third-party methods. Here we see a larger involvement from international law and third parties are involved. So here we have mediation, mediation, conciliation, inquiry, and good offices. Um, right after the dispute here in, in question and an image was settled, a maritime border dispute between Lebanon and Israel, Krista and I traveled to the area and took very excitingly a picture of the settled border. Um, again, a mediation so far has been very successful. Um, there are also events where uh, states just are unable to settle their territorial or maritime dispute via those non-binding methods. For one reason or another, they don't work or states may not want to settle them via non-binding methods. And here's where the big guys are brought in. So arbitration and adjudication. Arbitration being a bit less formal than adjudication, but outcomes of both are binding. Images are from the Qatar Bahrain um, dispute that was successfully settled in the International Court of Justice and Eritrea Yemen arbitration over Hanish Islands. The question that the book is asking, why would states choose, let's say, mediation over adjudication? Why would they choose negotiation over arbitration? And really the book, um, the book's theory can be summarized to um, strategic selection. States, number one, seek resolution methods that are perceived to be most likely to give them a victory. Because we're talking about very valuable things like territory, maritime areas, fishing rights, islands, pieces of land, people, um, oil, gas, all kinds of things. States do not wanna lose, they wanna win. Or as one of our um, interlocutors noted, states want to win, but at least not lose. So what do states do? They make strategic choices in selecting and participating in resolution methods. Why? Well, number one, they want to win, but also they want to have a uh, full control, as full as possible, over the resolution process itself. States have a hard time giving up control, not only over the outcome, but also how the outcome is achieved. And I'm going to give you here an example, one of my uh, very favorite examples. States strategize via a variety of means. They would like to hire uh, certain lawyers. They would like to um, do all kinds of things to um, achieve a victory. So they also strategize via using maps. These are, uh, as I said, my favorite maps. As you immediately gonna notice, the, the map above is very colorful and um, it portrays a um, very interesting way of a uh, country, in particular Trinidad and Tobago, to strategize and try to obtain victory. So this is an image used by Trinidad and Tobago um, to visualize its claims. James Crawford, who was Trinidad and Tobago legal counsel in his official remarks 
um, noted. Actually, it looks to me like a predatory seabird about to eat the island of Tobago, which make Barbados's recent overtures to Tobago part of the picture, you might say. After all, they might as well finish the job, having eaten the surrounded environment. There's nothing left by that but the egg. You know, uh, whether or not um, this image actually swayed the decision maker one, one, one way or another is, of course, impossible to decipher. But as our interlocutor um, interviewed for the purpose of this image noted, once you plant the image of a predatory seabird into somebody's mind, it's, it's there. The image is there and it's hard to unsee it. Now, the opposing side, so Barbados, presented a much less vivid um, image that is the image um, to the bottom. You know, you can't really visualize a predatory seabird here. All right, so how do states um, strategize? The book, I think, contributes greatly to the literature in portraying the entire resolution process as strategic. We conceptualize strategy in two stages. Number one, choice of venue strategic selection. So states are strategic in choosing the venue. So they may want to negotiate, they may want to mediate, they may want to arbitrate, adjudicate. This is the number one strategy. We call it the choice of venue strategic selection. But this is not where the strategy uh, ends. States continue in what we call the within venue strategic selection. What does it mean? Well, once she once um, states once a state settles on a particular method, let's say like adjudication and a particular venue such as international court of justice, lawyers get busy and strategize. In that venue, how do we select procedures? How do we do? What do we, um, what sort of claims do we arrange with the purpose of reducing uncertainty and um, winning, winning the case? So what do we focus on in the first stage? So again, choice of venue factors. This is what factors determine whether states choose negotiation over arbitration or over adjudication. Number one, states love to go to a venue that they have won in the past. And we know it from policymakers, from state legal counsel, from all kinds of places that states just enjoy winning, winning and they're willing to take a chance to win again in, a, in the same method. They also look around in the region. What have my friends done in the region? Have they won? Have they lost? Maybe the same fortune is in store for me. But we also believe that it's much more complicated. There is an important relationship between domestic law and international law. How do states perceive international law? Do they allow uh, international law to directly influence their policies? Do they respect rule of law? We also believe that states representing specific legal traditions, such as civil law, common law, and Islamic law have just simply put different preference towards specific methods. For instance, Islamic law states, um, we know from the scholarship, really prefer mediation. Um, within venue factors, so once a state decides that I'm gonna adjudicate, I'm gonna arbitrate, what do they do? Number one, they frame the claim. They, states don't always pursue all the claims available to them. They pick and choose. It might be a smaller, less important claim that they're willing to um, pursue. They strategize about jurisdiction. They shape the procedures. They hire certain people, whether it be arbitrators or state counsel. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my co-author, Krista Wigand. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, so just in the um, interest of time, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our research design. As Amelia mentioned, we had uh, a, a variety of methods, primarily interviews, but we also collected data uh, about all territorial disputes from 1945 to 2015. Uh, so in terms of our findings um, quantitatively, we did find a variety of, uh, of findings about the proposer state, the state that's making the claim, taking uh, the, the, the case to either do negotiations, mediation, arbitration, adjudication. And we found all sorts of different uh, findings about 
what would be more likely to make them choose particular methods like binding and so forth. Uh, I wanna jump ahead to just talk briefly about the uh, case study that we did, which was the Philippines uh, versus China arbitration, Annex 7, that was from 2013 to 2016. And uh, this was a uh, an attempt by the Philippines to uh, essentially uh, invalidate the nine dash line claim of uh, China in the South China Sea. China did not actually participate in the case, but Annex Seven allows under um, under UNCLOS allows uh, one party to bring uh, a case to uh, to to the arbitration panel. So uh, in this case, um, it was very important for the Philippines to make sure that they uh, had the right jurisdiction. So they were their government was very careful. Uh, I did a lot of interviews. Uh, I, I had a, a Fulbright scholarship in the Philippines and I uh, conducted uh, several dozen interviews with all of the people involved uh, with the exception of the, the president Aquino who, who's passed away. Uh, but I spoke with everybody else and they explained to me how strategic they really were thinking about how they could win this case regardless of, of the actual legal claims of, uh, of, of both China and the Philippines. And so, for example, they interviewed lawyers, uh, law firms, very carefully. They were very careful about thinking about what kind of venue they could go to where they have very clear jurisdiction. And you can see from this quote here uh, where the lawyer uh, who I interviewed, Paul Reifler, the, head, the lead counsel for the Philippines, talks about what kind of claims could survive a jurisdictional challenge. If they prevailed, would they provide meaningful relief to the, to the Philippines, meaning would they win? And so the objective was not let's go to court and see what happens. It was let's go to this panel and we're going to win. And whatever we do to win or whatever is needed to win, we're going to do it. So for example, they had to avoid uh, certain claims because uh, China had exempted uh, from articles 15, 74, and 83 uh, about uh, historic title claims, sovereignty uh, claims, and maritime boundary delimitation. So those were automatically off the table. And so what that meant was the uh, the lawyers and the law for uh, the government and the law uh, team could not go after any of these claims. So they chose other claims because this would they wouldn't have survived uh, jurisdiction. So what they did do is they they carefully focused on 15 claims, uh, primarily the the invalidation of the nine dash line. Uh, but most importantly, they, looked at what they really wanted the panel to do was determine uh, the status of the maritime features and the maritime entitlements, uh, and also the right for the Philippines to exercise its right within their their own uh, uh, exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, according to the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And all of these claims, these are just a, a couple, a few of them, but they were all consistent with UNCLOS. And that's very important because that meant they were on the side of the law, of international law. Uh, and this prevented China from claiming uh, certain maritime dis, uh, entitlements. And I'll show you why. Essentially what happened is that the, the, team, the legal team made a case uh, to request that uh, the maritime, certain maritime entitlements, were they rocks or, or reefs or shoals or were they actually islands? And uh, if you're familiar at all with maritime law, you'll know that uh, they're, in order to have uh, beyond the 20 nautical mile um, uh, zone right around the, 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 uh, the territorial sea, right around the entitlement, the feature, there is no other claim beyond that. There's no EEZ, there's no 200 miles. And so what the Philippine team did was they actually, knowing that these were mostly rocks, had the panel, because that's what that's what the legal uh, status was, declare that most of these features in the South China Sea, at least where the Philippines was claiming and, and China claimed, were actually not islands. And therefore, no one, including the Philippines, could actually claim them as islands and therefore claim those 200 nautical miles. And so what that meant is that essentially denied China from claiming any of those uh, entitlements as well. So they actually put themselves in a corner, but by doing that, they they were very strategic to, uh, per, to make sure that China could also not do that. Lastly, I'll just speak briefly about uh, that they selected, when they, they uh, selected their act, you know, the, the people who were involved in the case, uh, they were very, as I said, they were very careful about choosing the law firm. They actually were very careful about 
uh, selecting one of the, the, they were allowed to select one arbitrator and uh, they chose uh, Judge Rudiker Wolfram, who had been the former president of ITLOS. And they did that because he had certain rulings and writings that were thought to be favorable to the Philippine claims. Not that he was biased or supporting the Philippines, but that he, his uh, views on, on certain uh, aspects of UNCLOS would, would most likely support the Philippines. Uh, and then uh, finally, well, just to conclude, we want to, uh, we hope that this book is, is useful for students, scholars, policymakers, and practitioners. We really try very hard to make this book accessible to, uh, to, law, to international lawyers, government officials uh, involved in these kind of disputes to try to resolve these disputes. And we really have made a, a concerted effort to be clear that this is a combination of both international law, international politics, and international law. Uh, and and uh, as Rob mentioned about, uh, about occupation, these are very complex processes, very strategic, multi-tiered, both political and legal uh, tend to be intertwined. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I'll leave it, uh, end it on a, on a, a negative note. Uh, it seems like territorial disputes and maritime disputes will be going on for, for a long time. But this means, of course, there's lots of uh, opportunity to study these disputes and to resolve them uh, as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. Excellent. And uh, again, thank you for for respecting time, which leaves us with uh, 15 minutes um, for questions and discussion. Uh, in the chat function, I see Priya. Um, Priya, would you like to narrate your question? We can unmute you if, if you like that, if you would like that. Otherwise, uh, hopefully our panelists can see the question, which is about the issue of occupations in global commons or uh, of, of space and oceans. Sorry, I'm just reading the question here. Okay. Uh, Rob, have you looked at, it, at anything maritime related? Like in, in your... No, not me. I, I stick to land. Okay. I'm okay. not good at sea. Yes. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a complex question because, um, you know, there are countries, China, for example, has been trying to uh, have a little more access and control, even claiming parts or claiming access, I should say, to the Arctic, for example, where that really is global commons. And, uh, and there, so there are lots of ways that, that, that states can, can try to uh, extend control. I mean, most of the South China Sea is actually global commons. There's overlapping claims, but a lot of it is just open sea. Uh, so they, they're trying to do that. Uh, as, as, as Roger mentioned, that, you know, China put this barrier around the Scarborough Shoal and, and you know, they can do all sorts of things like that. Um, but but that is a that, luckily UNCLOS addresses that pretty clearly. There's no question about global commons. It is commons. That's there's no state that can claim those. So that is not something that a state could legally go after or resolve because there, there can't be any dispute. It would just be an automatic rejection. I think I want to add to this one that this is a completely different situation because legal ownership is not possible. So a claim is just not valid from the beginning. Okay. Uh, Natasha has indicated that she would like to, to speak. Um, I'm going to see if I can unmute her. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I voice type very often, so uh, which isn't the easiest to do if I'm listening to you. Uh, thank you. That was really interesting. I've uh, especially enjoyed Krista's work that I've read in the past. Uh, so Natasha Gall University of Westminster, quick questions for uh, for the speakers. So for um, Rob first. Rob, I going back to that box, the three by two box of the findings, I just wanted to ask, so you said the gradual process, the gradual and complex process. And then in another one of the sections, you said the entrenchment elsewhere and that entrenchment elsewhere always follows. And I wondered if there was any kind of indigeneity between those two things. Is it, is it always that an entrenchment elsewhere follows or is there always a or is there also a possible connection between a parallel entrenchment that then may affect a particular occupation like is there did you find that there was i understand you're only looking at specific cases but i wondered if you could say something to that and uh, and also like you said uh, the increase in violence part that you said violence is necessary but not significant i just wanted you to wanted to ask you once more if that 
if you wanted to like if that is a claim that you would that that you want to make a second time like is violence necessary i mean i'm more interested in peaceful resolution so do you think that is a finding that violence is always necessary even if not sufficient and uh, for the uh, uh, you know for for, uh, for the second paper for Krista and Amelia, just a very quick question again. Uh, so you said the record of in the choice of venue, you said the rec they look at the record of other states in the same region, and I wonder if it's is it is it that they look at the record of other states in the re same region, or do they look at the record of other states in similar kinds of resolutions even in other regions? Like, is the region is the geography the significant thing there? Thank you so much, Roger. Rob, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha, for those uh, questions. On the um, exit elsewhere, I think there is this link. Uh, I mean, each of those six conditions, I argue, were necessary, um, which goes back to the, your second point. But uh, there was a link that as soon as, you know, when there's this escalation in costs and a decline in benefits, uh, when you're a state involved in multiple occupations, as Israel and the US were, I think you get to the point where you know, actually, something has to give here. You know, we can't carry on this status quo indefinitely. Not only is it not good for us, um, but all these other actors in the other two arenas, the international and the bilateral arena, won't let it continue. Um, Nevertheless, just because one occupation is delegitimized doesn't mean every occupation is delegitimized from these case studies. It doesn't mean that the occupier then goes, actually, you know what, occupation is a really bad idea. Let's get rid of all of our occupations. It normally means the occupier goes, let's pick and look at the territory we value the least and then leave it and entrench ourselves elsewhere. And that can actually happen within occupations. I saw Arie uh, mentioned in uh, the comments uh, the occupation of the West Bank. And I think that's, um, I guess, the most pertinent case of that, where Israel has valued the territory differently based on um, its connection to the territory and the perceived value of that territory within the West Bank. So there's been plenty of occasions, for example, the Oslo Accords, where Israel, when we don't value these parts of the West Bank, because of various reasons, normally demographic factors, for example, but we do value these others for, uh, because of security reasons or an intangible link to the territory. So we'll use the goodwill gained or the lessening of pressure gained from leaving uh, those territories to entrench ourselves elsewhere. So it can actually lead to the perpetuation uh, and deepening of conflict. In terms of the violence question, uh, in these cases, it was necessary. That, look, there are very, very few cases in contemporary occupations where the occupied population throws up their hands and goes, yep, that's fine. You know, we're willing to accept foreign occupation. Um, an author called David Edelstein suggested that that only really happens when they perceive that there's an even bigger threat to the occupier that allows that occupation to be perpetuated. But otherwise, violence is going to manifest itself. And it is normally that escalation of violence that is then that sort of first push to make an occupier reconsider an occupation's strategic utility. Uh, and I'll stop there so I don't go on for too long. Krista, do you want to answer Natasha's question? No, go ahead. I can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So Natasha, thank you so much for your question. This is quite, this is an excellent question. You know, I'm sure that states do take into consideration everybody's win loss record because, of course, is if a dispute is substantially similar, uh, somebody else's dispute substantially similar jurisprudence, they will analyze the jurisprudence, they will analyze the stances on particular actor and see who won and who lost. However, um, we know that social bonds and this kind of social um, feeling is particularly strong in the region because states in one geographical region tend to uh, face similar um, disputes. And from what we have seen, even in the South China Sea dispute, is the mimicking of strategies and noticing who won and who lost in a particular venue. Thank you for that. Okay, we have a, a number of questions for Krista and Amelia in the Q&A. Um, and I'm going to bunch them together. So I'm afraid you're going to have to do some deft mental work to, to um, in, in responding to them. Uh, so the first is from Jackson Scott, who, who asked, I think, a really good question. And that is, how do grey zone warfare actors like the CCP's maritime militia factor into your study. What about new strategic areas like the Arctic where the CCP is present with no legitimate internationally recognized claims? Um, that's echoed by a, a question in the Q&A from Mohammed, who, who says, 
How do you see the role of China in asymmetric territorial disputes? Uh, and then we have uh, a question from Liana, uh, which asks, under what conditions can procedural rules of different legal mechanisms, such as international courts or arbitrarial venues, obstruct or facilitate strategic decision making by disputants? And actually, Ari mentions that in, in the chat about, about uh, the importance of, of procedural uh, rules. So uh, can you, mm -hmm. can you try, sorry to throw sure. this question Sala the... at you, but um, no I'm worries. well right. able to, uh, to respond. Sure, I'll take the first two and let Amelia answer the last one. Uh, so I think that, you know, this is an interesting situation because China, you know, the, the disputes around the territorial maritime disputes that China is has been involved in are very different than other kind of, you know, states disputes because of the power dynamics of so China is obviously, you know, a major power, you know, even, uh, you know, a significant major power, great power, um, where the other claimants in the South China Sea are much, much weaker. Um, if you look at the dispute between Japan and China and the East China Sea, the dynamics are very different because China, Japan is a more more powerful country. Uh, the other countries are not. So it's interesting. The Philippines has been treated like a kind of like a, a you know, a, you know, David and Goliath kind of case uh, where, you know, they stood up against this major power. But what China does is they use these gray zone tactics and so forth, as, as uh, Jackson mentioned. Uh, and they do really have, as Mohammed mentioned, and you know, noted, and a very asymmetric uh, claim efforts and everything. Um, the good news is uh, none of those are recognized under international law in any way. Uh, I'm not talking about the claims. I'm talking about the ways, uh, like when you build an artificial island, that does not mean it becomes an island. So all of those artificial islands in the South China Sea that that, Philip, that, that China has built up and, and militarized, none of those are recognized as legitimate, does not give them any maritime entitlements. It may give them power uh, projection, which is the, really the goal here. It's not really about, you know, that. So I think that's, those are important things to mention that, you know, the, that's part of the reason China would not participate in the arbitration is because they don't really care about the legal part. It's a, they, you know, it's, it's much more about power. And of course I could give an entire lecture, so I'll stop there. Uh, but if you're interested in, in uh, hearing more, uh, I'll give another talk another time. So Amelia. Okay, so excellent question about the procedural rules. Absolutely, when we think about arbitration and adjudication, those venues, those methods really provide kind of uh, the outer limits of wiggle room that states have. And th this wiggle room that is allowed, let's say, by arbitration or leg thereof that's provided of adjudication is exploited and explored by states before choosing the venue. But once they choose the venue, they know the layout they know the legal layout. They will go for arbitration precisely because the wiggle room is larger. They may avoid adjudication because the wiggle room is smaller. But if with the assessment of the legal counsel, um, the wiggle room provided by adjudication or arbitration is large enough, aware of this wiggle room, aware of those other limits, states will strategize, like with the maps, for instance. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the, in the chat from Joel, and I'm I'm going to throw it at you, Rob. But um, it it may be that Amelia and, and Krista come in, and that asks what elements must be combined for international law to be effective in the face of events such as occupations, interventions, and territorial occupations. Why does international law work in some cases and and not in others? Uh, well, that is a good question, but I think it's really important to emphasize that, you know, we're talking about all these occupations and territorial disputes. It's important to note that actually international law does work on the, uh, on these aspects. Yes, you know, there are occupations going on that continue to this day, but there has been a marked decline in the number of uh, annexations and indeed occupations since the crystallization of these international laws and norms in 1945. And uh, this kind of goes back to some of Arie's really important points here as well. Arie mentioned that, you know, um, it's kind of you can argue that actually the occupation of the West Bank by Israel is effective because Israel has been there for so long. And indeed, is it an occupation at all? Because it doesn't seem temporary. And even if, you know, this is a really convoluted uh, and contested territorial dispute, it really, I think it encapsulates 
that actually the international law does generally work. I'd be, I don't like counterfactuals, but I strongly suspect if these um, territorial integrity norms weren't in place, Israel would have actually already annexed all or parts of the West Bank. The reason it doesn't, and the reason it sort of uh, perpetuates this uh, ambiguous status quo is because it knows that it will get in too much trouble if it does. So it tries to carry on with what uh, another um, colleague, scholar, uh, Richard Mass, uh, is called fates accompli, basically annexation without actually calling it annexation. Uh, so I think that's the key takeaway there, that even if you know we are focusing on these disputes and as academics, it's in our personal interest to say these are a big problem, they are persistent, it is also important to note that international law has caused a marked decline in occupations and annexations. I'll just add briefly that you know when states have chosen to take their disputes to be resolved, but especially in, in legal binding methods, the compliance levels are extremely high. So it's really you know, international law is helping uh, the states. It's just the states have to get to the point where they want to use, you know, resolve the disputes. In the best ISA tradition, I'm going to go over the time limit, but only by a few minutes. And then we have to imagine ourselves at an ISA convention and, and run um, and buy overpriced coffee uh, and run to the next panel. Um, so uh, there's a question for... Uh, Amelia and Krista, and that comes from Ban, who asks, could you comment on the implications of your work on the democratic peace? Do democracies prefer specific dispute resolution methods over others, or most of the disputes between mixed dyads, one democracy, one autocracy? Um, obviously, there's a lot in there, but I, I think the, the, there's a fundamental issue a, in relation to democracies. Uh, so I'm going to start here because it's my favorite topic. I always had a problem with people saying that democracy uh, by itself, so regime type by itself, causes states to shape their preferences. I think we need to more look at the quality of the domestic legal system. So things like rule of law, judicial independence, this specific fact, these specific factors associated with democratic regimes, this is what we have to study, not a regime type itself. Um, and this book does address it. We have a very good discussion and empirical findings with regard to rule of law, and they're really unclear. Rule of law by itself measured specifically as the quality of domestic legal system, so judicial independence, uh, executive vis-a-vis -vis, um, judicial relationship doesn't have a statistically significant effect on the state's choices to be more, let's say, uh, prone to use binding methods of dispute resolution. And I think, Chris and I, we have a previous scholarship precisely on the topic that uh, speaks the same thing. Um, that really is a contested relationship, and we need to do a lot more research, but there it is. Thank you. Excellent question. Big question. Thank you. Well, I, I guess that's one for your next book. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm afraid we're out of time, and I'm afraid that uh, there are still a few questions out there. There's a really interesting one from Jackson on the, on the temporality of, of occupation, but I'm afraid um, uh, we're out of time. But I guess you can email uh, the authors. I just want to finish by congratulating uh, the authors on, on their books. It's a, a magnificent achievement. Um, it's not an easy achievement, and so much of academia is based on critique, which is frankly uh, being curmudgeonly. Um, and I think we do we spend far too little time congratulating uh, people on major achievements and on celebrating um, these. So I I just want to um, congratulate the authors on on their books. I've delved into them, and they are major pieces of work, and I think uh, contributions to our understanding. And, and study. So thank you everyone uh, for attending and thank you very much for, for uh, to the panelists and to ISA um, for hosting us. I think that this model works and all we have to do is write more books and um, appear on these. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Roger. Thank you all. Thank Take you. Care.